My name is David Anderson. I'm the Horticulture Operations Supervisor for the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. Um, we're at the Jesse Al Dugan Native Plant and Greenhouse Facility, and we're here to talk about river cane. Well, I oversee the facility, and so I come up with the production plans. We do a multitude of projects, including working with pollinators, native plants, seed banking, um, restorations, forestry. And so our job is to make sure we're producing the plant material that are needed for tribal projects. This is our uh, main propagation house. It's a Van Wingard and MX3. It's a glass structure with um, a complete agro system. So everything's controlled as far as the heat, the fans, the roof, the shade cloth. And so everything that we're starting in here is going to be going out into the nursery or onto a tribal project. And it's 2,160 square feet. Well, we rely on the community input a lot um, regarding what kind of native plants we're going to be growing. Um, depending what our artisans or community members may be seeing a lack of population-wise, we try to listen to them a lot, but we also uh, grow a lot of plants for our forestry, watershed uh, folks regarding uh, tribal projects. And so whatever they may need is what we'll be growing as well. We're mainly working on doing installations on areas that may have been in river cane production in the past. Um, a lot of stream bank work as far as stabilization on our watershed projects, but we're also going in and doing invasive species removal on some areas and repop repopulating with river cane as the species of choice. This isn't exactly a sustainable method. Uh, as far as repopulating river cane by taking it out of its native habitat and moving it somewhere else. But when this material is, a, is available, we're happy to do that. But we want to keep that plant in its natural habitat. But we don't, now we don't know what makes that plant go to bloom and seed. We don't know what factors causes that. So if you see a large patch of river cane out anywhere and you see it's brown and died back, that's one plant. That's a, that's a rhizome that's stretched 100 yards and all of it's gone to seed and died. We don't know what triggers that, but I would like to know why that goes to seed, when it's gonna to go to seed, and how I can collect that seed and use that as my propagation material rather than having to rely on using rhizomes from an existing patch to do any kind of propagation. Okay. In 10 years, I'm hoping to see a little bit more research completed at that point. Most of the river cane research began, I believe, in the late 90s. So we don't know a lot about this plant, but there is some movement. And so we need that. We need the universities to, to do research, the Forest Service, um, the USDA. But I would like to see more river cane breaks conserved. And I would like to see more cane planted. Um, I don't know where we can have the population at that point. Um, but we need this plant in the environment. And so in 10 years, I would like to see it as a, a focused species for a number of different groups as far as revitalization goes. Well, I think we first have to recognize how important this plant is, um, not only to indigenous peoples in the Southeast, but as to everybody that lives in the landscape. Um, you know, obviously it provides that very important cultural resource for many tribes, but it also, it also has an important role in the ecology of clean water and bank stabilization, especially in the high elevations. Um, we need this plant to keep clean water. It's a plant that we want to continue to propagate here, and it's obviously got an important role in our watershed projects already. So this is a very suitable material for artisans and for the ecological purpose that it stands in our environment. Um, I think the last figure I saw was that river cane was at 2% of what it was historically. So the population, in my opinion, is, is very endangered. And so we wanna do our part to be able to provide this cane, not only on the boundary, but also to other projects going on in the area and the traditional homelands of the Cherokee. Hey, my name is uh, Will Tushka. I'm the uh, horticultural technician for EBCI and I work with Natural Resources Department. 
Um, I started here in about uh, 2018, or the fall of 2018. Um, and I've, you know, grown into the project uh, uh, with high hopes of uh, preserving our natural native plants and uh, species. It's native to our people, Cherokee people. It's used by craft people, you know, making, whether it be blow guns or um, baskets, mats, you know, stuff like that. So it's a pretty vital part of our culture. So that excites me. Because when you look at a basket, you see how beautiful it is. But then, and then you see the work that the workers put into it, the, the making the splints, uh, the cuts on their hands, you know, and all that put, time put into it. And then you're able to go and look at, look at it in the wild or in our setting here and be able to look through the ground and see what, where it's coming from. So that, that is really a big, it was a good learning lesson for me. Made me appreciate it more and appreciate those artists more. To me, it's, uh, I know there's probably a time where they could go anywhere around here and get it, what they need at their supply, but it seems like over the years, they have to go off reservation or even out of state to get a quality product. And hopefully we can bring it back where they won't have to drive as far, you know, or trek through the woods in Georgia or wherever, you know, someone go to Tennessee and Virginia. So. So hopefully we can uh, grasp it and get it going and be able to have spots around the reservation or, you know, tribal lands where we can produce it, grow it, take care of it for future generations. And um, I'd love to be able to see, you know, do like a class from say Cherokee High, you know, or, or a group of people go to say somewhere here in Cherokee, or even come here to the greenhouse and harvest their own. That'd be something, I would like that.